Okay, here we go. We're at the Coral Historical Society. All right. If, if I could have your attention, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Um, welcome to the 2019 summer exhibit for the Cornwall Historical Society. Those of you who've had a chance to look around have seen the quality of the show, the imagination that's been put into our visiting exhibition here, and we're just terribly pleased to be able to offer it to you. But you know, I realize that many of you have not met our new curator, Suzanne Fatte, known as Susie. Yes. Where'd you go? Here she is. She's right behind me. And um, she comes with a come on. She comes with enormous museum background and vision, professionalism, and a huge amount of energy, which we're very grateful to have. So um, Susie put together this show, and as a add-on, because we were talking about the tornado, we came to understand that Paper Bach had done some work on an artistic, is that what you call it? I think it is. Really imaginative installation about the pines. Now Paper wasn't here when the storm happened, but he grew up beside the remains of the storm up on Essex Hill Road. So do you want to say a few words about what you've got here? Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Um, so yeah, I want to start off by just uh, thanking everybody, um, particularly Susie, who put this exhibition together and worked really hard to, to make it happen. And I also want to thank the committee, um, as well as the board of directors of the Historical Society, um, for making space for my installation um, to be able to exist here in the Historical Society. Um, <clears throat> as well as some of the events that we planned in relation to uh, this exhibit. Um, so I'll just say a couple things about these uh, folders. So um, this project began uh, initially um, when I was uh, just hiking in the pines uh, last summer. And I started to notice that there was uh, significant changes happening in the area that I call the last stand, uh, which is the one section of the Cathedral Pines that was not felled by the tornado. Um, this is a section of the Cathedral Pines that's right beside my childhood home um, up on Essex Hill Road. And I spent many years um, hiking in the Cathedral Pines and hiking particularly in this area that was not felled by the storm. And it's a place of magic and a place of spirit and a place that, that I'm quite attached to. Um, and I, I started to notice um, last summer that um, a, few a few large trees had come down uh, in storms and what had replaced them was a sea of saplings, uh, black birch saplings. Um, and I also noticed that there were marking tags on a lot of the trees in this section of the Cathedral Pines. And I was curious who had left these tags. Um, I had some sense that after the tornado that forest ecologists had sort of stormed into the area and done a lot of research into the Cathedral Pines. Um, but, I, but I didn't really have any awareness if that knowledge had been returned to the community. Um, and so I was interested in how the sort of speculative predictions of forest ecologists working right after the storm aligned with what was actually happening now, 30 years later. So I started getting in touch with different regional forest ecologists who had been involved in the research that happened right after the storm. Um, and I was finding that what was happening was, was kind of different than what the projections had been. Um, and so I'm an artist. Um, I'm currently a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University. And my artist practice also involves writing. And so I, I started a project where um, I wanted to sort of tell the tell a narrative about the life cycle of the Cathedral Pines. Um, and I was actually taking a course at the time called Contextual Practice. Um, and contextual practice is sort of an idea in art where 
the project is more about a social interaction and a relationship than a formal art object itself. And I thought that because of my interest in ecology and our relationship to thinking about uh, ecology, thinking about our relationship to our surroundings, um, as well as my interest in sort of narrative writing, that the Cathedral Pines would be maybe quite an interesting site to deal with. Um, so as I started writing this essay, which, by the way, um, I have a solo exhibit at the Cornwall Historical Society that will be paintings and prints. Um, that is going to open in October, and then I'm going to release this uh, at, the library. at the library. What did I say? Historical. Ah, sorry. At the library. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm basically working on a small edition art book that's going to be in part a uh, photo archive, image archive, and in part an essay about about the life cycle of the Cathedral Pines. So uh, what I became interested in was thinking about the Cathedral Pines as something of a um, case study in our sort of collective ecological imaginary. And um, of course the big keyword that comes up here is the concept of conservation. Um, that's a big keyword in, in the life cycle of the Cathedral Pines. So I started thinking about, you know, what has uh, conservation meant in the past? How does this idea of conservation in fact sort of construct and produce the site of the Cathedral Pines? Um, and what does conservation mean today, and furthermore, what might it need to mean in our future of navigating a sort of climate change world. So that is sort of some of the framework of how these particular uh, pieces were composed. I'm taking images from the Historical Society archives as well as the archives of John Calhoun and other residents in town and you know, recycling them through this sort of folder pop-up mechanism into something of a life cycle narrative. Um, so yeah, this question of what might ecology, or what might conservation need to mean um, as we navigate this new period of ecological history is you know, kind of what I'm hoping to point towards eventually with both the writing that I'm doing and, and also this installation. So I hope that you get the chance to chew on some of those questions and also get to digest all of this interesting material that we have here today, and thank you so much to and the check the library side. this fall. Yeah, Absolutely. check the library this fall. Thank you, Paper. That's great. Thank you. Well, the biggest change is that black birch is. Uh, it has always been a dominant recession species, but in this case, it's almost a total recession species. And in the early writing on the process of forest secession, um, there's, it's often expected that oaks will come in. Oaks will be uh, a larger part of the secession process. And across New England, that's not happening um, in the way that people have expected based on previous ecological accounts. So because of changing climate conditions, the black birch has a different relationship to secession. And that is something, by the way, that uh, Peter Del Tredici is going to be talking about in his talk. And I'll just say two more things, which are that we do have two more events coming up. Um, we have two events organized in relation to uh, this blown, uh, in relation to our exhibit here, and um, that's on July 6th. We have Barton Jones, who's the president of the Cornwall Conservation Trust, talking about uh, Cornwall's forests today, talking about um, augmenting wildlife corridors in the region, talking about the health of Cornwall's forests and what relationship that has to uh, sustainable economic development. Um, and then we also, on July 13th, we have uh, Peter Del Tredici, who's going to do a hike in the Cathedral Pines. It's going to be a sort of educational um, hike uh, talking about the botany of the forest secession process. Right. So I hope you, you can join us. Uh, July 13th at 1 p.m. with Peter Del Tredici and July 6th. You have the information in your hand. Yeah, there. July okay. 6th with Barton Jones. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For a real historical perspective on the tornado, I now introduce Gordon Ridgway, our first select. I'm going to sit down. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to speak. Um, I've got to say, life is funny uh, sometimes because this week I was got a call from my friends in the Johanna Hayes 
uh, office and they invited me to uh, come in to a fundraiser with Nancy Pelosi tonight in five minutes. But having great respect and fear for your president, I said I have a previous commitment. And it's, and it's not just because um, I have a long time friendship with uh, Lisa, but I think it's also I've become increasingly aware of the importance of this institution telling Cornwall's story, which is, is unique. And in this day of, of fake news and who can who knows what where we are today without knowing where we were yesterday. And we've had a great uh, shared project uh, with uh, Spencer Markow and Susie has helped him with his research uh, to Civil War uh, veterans honoring the people from this town, over 175 of them who fought in that conflict and 20 of them didn't come home. And again, having the resources here to uh, help tell that story is really important because we are the only ones that can really tell that story. And as Cornwall unfolds, it is a very interesting place and has a, in some ways, a national, international presence. It's very important that its, that its story, its information is, is held here in this place. So again, Susie and Paper and, and Lisa, thank you for putting this together because it brings back memories of 30 years ago to many people here in town. And having uh, been here before, uh, before I was first selectman uh, in 1989 on that night when we came down here and seen at the intersection of, of Pine Street um, and Route 4, her Blake's car with a tree on top of it, all the trees you can see in these pictures were over the roads. Uh, and it was a real, it was a real tornado. You can't really see the images right now if you drive through here, but a lot of work had to be done and it was, it was, there was danger involved with it. Luckily no one got hurt, but it required real work of a bunch of people. And part of the story too is the way this town turned out. Uh, the many people who volunteered, even with hand saws, chainsaws, tr farm tractors, trucks, whatever they can do, they came here to help. 20 volunteer fire departments from surrounding towns came here for weeks to help out. Uh, the Blakeys famously opened up their kitchen, and I remember talking to someone from the utility company, and they said they've never seen a response in New England like this to a tornado. They said they were down on, on the southern New England, and people just sat, would stay down on their lawns, and the lawn chairs and watch all the work to be done, whereas here, <laughs> the work was being done right from the start. And uh, again, they, and people were welcome. Uh, there was no, there was, as we say, emergency services. There was integrated command. Uh, and again, thanks to the people that were here at the time. People may not be still here. Gary Heppert was the fire chief. Uh, Rick Washburn, the assistant fire chief. The Dakins. Dick was the first uh, selectman, Barbara was town clerk. Town hall stayed open. Patsy Van Dorn just set up in the town hall and, and dealt with everybody's problems. So there was real amazing response to this, this uh, sort of unprecedented crisis in an, in an incredible way. And I think it was sort of a formative experience for the people that went through it uh, as far as how people worked together uh, and just dropped everything else they had to do and just um, and just did what had to be done. I can remember uh, delivering diapers up to, on Great Hill to There was a newborn uh, bo uh, born during the tornado and her, fam and her family stayed on a long driveway so we delivered diapers to them uh, for quite a while. And I can also remember being down here in the village and having this landscape that, that a lot of people grew up with just totally changed. Yeah. And to the right of that picture there, Route 4, which that's the main part of Route 4, was Mrs. Hurlburt Sr. who was in a house uh, for 24 hours uh, before people remember there was a house over there. And she said, well, I know you guys would show up sometime. <laughs> and, you know, no, no, no big problem here. But, I mean, her house is totally covered with, with debris. And <clears throat> we were, so initially when the fire alarms went out, we just thought that there was a problem because this was so cut off that there was more of a problem down in the valley of who's a tonic in Sharon because we could get down to that area. So we spent a bunch of time down there and then we realized the tornado jumped from the uh, river up over the hill and in here. And then when we came down here that night, uh, there, there was, uh, 
you know, there was debris everywhere, we couldn't get anywhere. So I remember walking with Chris Hopkins up through the Cathedral Pines that night. It took us about three hours to get from the corner of Jewel Street up to the top of um, Essex Hill to check on people in, in Paper's house. Uh, but we had, we were 15 feet above the ground because you couldn't see the road because all the pines were over the roads. So we had to jump from tree to tree to tree to tree. And so it took a long time to get up there, but sure enough, the other thing, the other memory was you could hear this noise down Valley Road and it was Denny Frost firing up his bulldozer and making his way up Valley Road. So instantly all these people just got to it and just started gnawing on these huge amount of debris yeah. um, and just did and then there was another group that was gnawing their way out up <coughs> Great Hollow. So we hooked up with them and realized it was a, a big deal. Um, and then eventually, you know, we were sort of on our own for probably 24, 48 hours before the state came and, and, and they helped out. Um, so I remember one story where somebody said, well, the state hasn't done anything. And somebody was on TV saying that. And said, uh, Dick, the governor's over here. Oh, well, actually, it's great to have him here. So, <laughs> so anyway, there was a lot of uh, interesting stories that happened from there. But I think, again, the, the community spirit that was displayed by this unique place at that hopefully unique time was tremendous. And it's great to have it, again, all recorded on display. Congratulations on your interpretation to know that's still going. And I'll tell you another funny story that my father was actually on the um, board of nature, local uh, board of nature conservancy who had an easement on the Cathedral Pines at the time, and he and George Brown, who's a local forester, had just gone through and filed their annual report the day before, saying the Cathedral Pines are in great shape. They put it in the mail, and all of a sudden, <laughs> so anyway, um, you never know how things turn out. But again, thank you very much, and thanks for the yeah, thanks shout out to the Blakey Diner out here. Yeah. This was Jerry and Pat's idea to have this be the food at the reception. So there's a lot of hot dogs out there. Some of them donated by BJ's very kindly. But it was just a marvelous thing they did. And, and we've got it going again. So enjoy that. And thank you all for coming. Yay, Cornwall. Yay.